I, I come to on some people white or some shit like you know what I mean I see for white has a monopoly on 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 reading and having an education in America it seems like that because they created it to be such you know what I mean but me growing up in Africa even though we were being we were being contained on a level higher than that level on on equal footing the schools were the schools if you went to a good school you were competing against people that looked like you and when I say compete when I say educational comp competition yeah we was hungry for you yeah, know we was hungry for you know what I mean that's why when we come to America we see all all, all these especially when you come to America at a young enough age that you get to go to high school here it's a difference when an immigrant comes to America and goes to 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 high school or middle school compared to when they come and they pass that school level they either go straight to college or they start a college or they don't go to school at all they just have to work in the workforce it's a different it's a different assimilation process and it's a different assimilation understanding you know what i mean like over time there's a difference you know what i mean like I, my foreign brothers and sisters get it yeah i get it I mean, I'm, I'm just psychoanalyzing, babbling, you know, mm -hmm. babbling, nitpicking on the niggling little, yeah. What up, Jamel? I hear you at the Atlantic now. Let's go. Let's go. I remember I go with Jamel here at the Atlantic. Man, ESPN got rid of motherfucking, they got rid of the six, they got rid of his and her, they got rid of numbers never lie. This fool's, this fool's got rid of Sports Nation, though. This bomber's guy with the sports nation, though. I see Jorge, Jorge rising up, you know what I mean? But high noon is vicious. High noon is vicious, you know what I mean? But yeah. I, I know the dress code is not going to allow Bomani to pop up in a T-shirt celebrating some that conservative America, and I wouldn't be so, you know. But now you're a smart... You're a smart Stephen A. Ishmael, a Wilbur Ish kind of brother, so they ain't gonna fuck with you. Now they can't fuck with you anyway, but I digress. But when he looked at, at high achieving black males and compared them to other black males who were middle and low achieving, he started to see success factors. A factor of Dr. Tosin's research has been looking at outliers, the highest achievers within the group. He claims that is where we find the most reasonable strategies for success, both for students and for schools. To develop strategies that help predominantly black and brown schools do well, we cannot look at, pre and at schools that are predominantly white. Find the predominantly black and brown schools that are doing better than trends and talk to the principals, teachers, students, and parents and ask them how they are doing a good job despite the circumstances. That makes sense. That is, that is perfect common sense. I'm just saying. Second, what standards are being used? Schools are often, use, are often using comp competing standards because those, those for university admissions are, are often different than for states. Schools are preparing students for tests such as the SATs that universities are looking at less and less. Another problem hurting black teachers is implied standards. <sighs> yes. Oh, wow. You hit it on the nose. I right. mind you now, you are getting, you are getting a treat here. This episode right here, man, right here, this whole, this whole reading why I'm doing this, you get a treat because this is, this is like something awesome that I actually have great belief in and and I'm reading it for the first time. Your first reading of anything is like the awesomest reading ever. I'm just saying. Like Richard Castle said, what I wouldn't give to be able to read all the books I've ever read in my life over again because I develop amnesia. But I can't say I, I can't say I want that though. Because that means I would, I would have to, to read Race Matters all over again and have respect for Cornel West, even though I've lost respect for him. But I'm sorry, brother. 
I did not dislike you. I did not not like you. I just I've lost respect for you. You know what I mean? Like you're not my enemy. You're black. You could never be my enemy. Me personally. You know what I mean? But hey, we are living in America, right? Divide and conquer. Make them mentally weak and physically strong, and you control them from generations. Willie Lynch, motherfucker. Fuck, fuck, asaka. What up, M? Another problem, hurt, another problem hurting black teachers is implied standards. Black teachers have the highest probability of getting a low rating when they teach at a predominantly black school with a black principal. Why? Because the principal is using standards set forth by the state that has in mind predominantly white suburban schools. using the matter using the matter standards to measure Northwestern teachers. So it don't work out well. Mm. Or using Edna Roosevelt standards to measure to to gauge back those standards. I mean, I, I had to leave at Roosevelt High School after my ninth grade year and attend my 10th, 11th, and 12th grade year at Parkdale. So I know the difference firsthand back then. And yeah, I, I, I don't think, I don't know. Uh, but Parkdale was vicious, though. Parkdale was vicious, you know what I mean? Parkdale was Parkdale. Parkdale was Parkdale, you know what I mean? Parkdale had everything and everybody. Parkdale was like that. I don't know how it is now, but you know. They just lost the principal, may she rest in peace. What, Mrs. Washington, I think it was? I might be getting, I didn't know one, but may she rest in perfect peace. Why? Because the principal is using standards set forth by the state that has in mind predominantly white suburban schools. These standards don't consider what it truly takes for teachers to succeed in areas of, of concentrated poverty. Those standards don't consider the extra mile and the extra time the teachers take to give the students the support they need. Instead, a black principal has to rate the teacher the same as a white teacher in the suburb who is teaching students with access to greater resources. Third, put the best research to use properly. According to Dr. Tosin, the schools in the United States are not using the best research. A lot of schools focus on graduation rates and national assessments of educational progress scores, NAEP. But there are other sets of rich data, such as the high school longitudinal study and parental participation. These studies provide more useful information about students, which correspond with the four primary factors Dr. Tosin identified in breaking barriers. The proper, P-R-O-P-E-R, -E way to educate black students. Rather than asking why young black males are failing, Dr. Torsen urged us to ask why schools are failing young black males. That is why he created a six-point call to, to action for, for the nation. The proper way to educate black students reframes and reiterates key information from Challenge the Status Quo, a report he co-authored with Dr. Chance Lewis in 2012. The P, principals, counselors, and teachers should have mandatory trainings and resources to develop cultural competence, enhance empathetic, uh, uh, enhance empathic, emph enhance empathy and respect, defense management, and classroom management. R, reduce suspensions. Yeah, yeah, that will help. That will help. If a student knows they're not going to get suspended for something, they most likely will not going to do it again. You, you, you might be sitting there thinking, nah, it's the other way around. They think they're going to get suspended. They, they're not going to do it again. But if you're going to get suspended, you can have the day off from school. Keep their ass in school. I uh, mean, send them to class. Yeah, you did something wrong. Yeah, I get it, but bring your ass to school the next day. I'm just saying. The R, reduce suspensions. 
O. Offer a culturally aligned and academically enriching curriculum. Yeah. Giving books to read like Dr. King's While We Can't Wait. Richard Rustin's The Color of Law. Michael Eric Dyson's What Truth Sounds Like. Or Stokely Carmichael's, you know, Black Power. Or Olivia Butler's Kindred. You know. Or even giving Marshall Gerson's the future is history. How totalitarianism will reclaim the worship. You can even throw rise and follow with Todd Reich in it. You can even throw a fountain head in it. You know what I mean? Just, you know. Mix it up for them, though. Even though I'm no longer talk to white people about this. Let white students read there with black students in class. Let black students read there with white students in class. Force him at a young age to deal with it. And even if something break out, let them come back to school the next day. Let them deal with it. Like, I, I, I know it sounds crazy, it sounds far-fetched, but thinking back at that time, literally, having you deal with something at a young age prepares you better for the future. I'm just saying. Prepares you not to have to be confrontational about things moving on. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, then teachers can come into play, parents can come into play, counselors can come into play, then the P can come into play, you know? But, yeah. The second P, parents should have support from the school. E, eliminate biases, stereotypes, and misinformation from school staff. R, regularly monitor collective students' progress. Get engaged. Dr. Tonsi made a big impression on Dr. Carwan and the Carwan Commission. Watch the video of his presentation to get the full details. The Q&A with Carwan commissioners delved, delves more into the role of parents and concentrated poverty in recruiting and retaining black teachers. But will the commission comprise of a rather homogeneous group with little or no experience With little or no experience in developing school strategies for black and brown students, put his presentation into action. We hope to see Dr. Tolson's analysis and findings in the commission's final recommendation this fall. It's not too late to get engaged and impact the commission's work. The morning sessions of the full commission are live streamed but the working groups are not, so your attendance matters. You can find material and, 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 and meeting schedules for the current commission here. Stay tuned to the current commission, this and that, okay. Let me go there and see. Their next schedule here was on the 10th, okay. Wow. Hmm. They just had it yesterday. Awesome sauce. They have a next work session on the 31st of October from 9, 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. The full commission is going to be at the house office building in Annapolis in room 120. Material will be posted as it become available. Doesn't seem like nothing. Doesn't seem like anything has been done about that yet. So, wow. So, that homogeneous committee that gets to to decide that gets to decide on a uh, on what kind of curriculum. schools teach black and brown students, whether or not Dr. 
whether or not the commission uh, would uh, would accept whether or not the the commission would accept uh, Dr. Weingold's Dr. Tosin's uh, uh, recommendation on the proper ways to educate black students. The next meeting is on the 31st of October, a week before election day. So let's see who are these members. And I'm sure the members of this commission are either elected or they are appointed by somebody who's elected, you know what I mean? And these are the people who represent, who represent, who, who made the decisions on our lives, who made the decisions on whether or not black lives matter, you know what I mean? And imagine if the lives it is, that have been affected go out and go cast a ballot for somebody from their community who's been affected by this, who knows what certain priorities. There are plenty of parents who are qualified to sit on that commission. There are plenty of parents in plenty of school districts who are qualified. There are plenty of parents who are concerned. They're their students. It's not gain. The right amount of education they deserve to begin as American citizens just because of the color of their skin. You know what I mean? Who are, who are very qualified. And a lot of them are mothers. Please, you know what I mean? Like, just now think about that. Yeah, I know that ain't no lie. Yeah, I know that ain't no lie. Come on now. This again by, by Nicole McCann. Thank you, man. It's, it's titled, Who are the Carwin Commissioners? August the 2nd of 2018. Maryland stands on the, on the threshold of a new era in the education of Maryland students as policymakers weigh their options for a new education formula. The Commission on, I on Innovation and Excellence in Education, commonly referred to as the Carwin Commission, is a 25-member body currently working to, re to rewrite Maryland's current education funding scheme. The Commission ha has a heavy charge. They are responsible for reviewing and assessing current education financing formulas and accountability measures and how each local school system is spending its funds, including the increased state funds provided through the Bridge to Excellence in School Public Act, Chapter 288, Act of 2002. While the Commission released pre preliminary recommendations in January 2018 and hoped to release their final reports this fall, it was originally scheduled to be released in December 2016. The interim recommendations for Maryland's public education system are bold, but we must continue to push for commissioners to use a race equity lens to each of the four working groups listed below. The Maryland General Assembly will review the commission's recommendations and craft legislation to implement changes to the taunting formula that hopefully will equitably support the needs of all Maryland children. These 25 commission members will shape education funding policy for the next generation of Maryland children. So, who are the current commissioners? Okay. Now, I'm going to tell the race of each individual based on the picture they have here. Don't be mad at me. I've already pointed out this is America. Race ain't no... Like, don't shy away from it, okay? Don't, it's not gonna bite you. It's just gonna make you feel bad for a second, you know what I mean, but. William E. Britt Cowan, PhD, appointed by Senate President Thomas Miller Jr., okay? So they are appointed, they're not elected, okay? Commission Chair, chosen by Governor, States, Senate President, and House Speaker. Dr. Kerwin is the Chancellor Emeritus of the University System of Maryland. David M. Steiner, PhD, appointed by Governor. David Steiner is Director of the Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy and Professor of Education at Johns Hopkins University. You know what? 
a, it's a set of pointing out the race of each individual person. I'm just going to point out who's, who's black or brown. How is that? That would be easier. It would be like maybe one or two or zero people. I haven't seen the whole list yet, but so I'm going to go to that name. That's the second person. Scott Dorsey, appointed by governor. Mr. Dorsey is chairman of the board and executive, uh, chief executive officer at Merit Properties, LLC. Nancy J. King, King, appointed by Senate President Thomas Miller, Jr. Nancy King is a Democratic state senator representing District 39 in Montgomery County. She serves as the state chair of the Joint Commission on Children, Youth, and Families. Richard S. Maldalino, Jr., appointed by Senate President Thomas Miller, Jr., which Maldalino is a Democratic state senator representing District 18 in Montgomery County. He serves on the Senate Budget and Taxation Commission. Paul G. Pinsky. Good old Pinsky. What's up, man? What's up, man? I heard that name is so long. Appointed by Senate President Thomas Miller, Jr., Paul Pinsky is a Democratic state senator representing District 22 in, in Prince George's County. He currently sits on the Health, Education, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Stephen M. Walk, appointed by, states pres by Senate President Thomas Miller, Jr. Stephen, Stephen Walk is a Republican state senator representing District 29 in Culvert and St. Mary Co St. Mary's counties. He is a member of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Kalman Buzzy Hedelman, appointed by House Speaker Michael, Michael Bush. Buzzy, that's his nickname. I don't know how you, how you get that nickname, Buzzy. Stay Buzz, huh? Buzzy Hedelman is a former member of the Baltimore School Board, former State Human Resource Secretary, an advocate for children with disabilities. I'm sorry, Buzzy. I'm sorry. Ooh, I just see my first colored individual, my first sister. Go ahead, girl. Man, I know you must be going through some things in there. You walk in there, you see all those white faces. It's a wrap. You're like, oh, shit. I got to put up with this shit again today. Let me stop. Adrian A. Jones, appointed by House Speaker Michael Bush. Adrian Jones is a Democratic state delegate, serves on the Appropriations Committee, and is the current speaker pro attempt, the first African-American female to serve in that position in Maryland. We got a first. After 400 years. Let's go, girl. I feel you, man. I don't want to say go out and vote, but please. I don't want to say, man, I'm tired of hopping on that. I'm tired of hopping on that. I'm tired of hearing myself say it, you know what I mean? But if I'm tired of it, y'all tired of it. So I'm going to shut that shit up about that. But still, y'all know where I'm going with it. And Kaiser, so, so far now we got one. Are you keeping count with me? And Kaiser, appointed by House Speaker, Speaker Michael Bush. And Kaiser is a Democratic state delegate representing the District 14 and, and, and serves on the Ways and Means Committee. She is Maryland's Majority Leader and the Chair of the Montgomery County House Delegation. Maggie McIntosh, appointed by House Speaker Michael Bush. Maggie McIntosh is a Democratic State Delegate representing, representing District 43 in Baltimore City. She is the outgoing chair, chairman, chairwoman of the Environmental Matters Committee and incoming chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee. She's also a former Baltimore City Public School teacher. Much respect, man. I respect teachers, man. Got mad love for love for teachers, you know. I'm trying to tell you. Like, hey, mother, please. My my entire plan, my entire basis, yo, know, my pops would tell you this, you know what I mean? Geneva's mom would tell you this. Anybody know, like, my entire basis of business in the future of Sierra Leone, honestly, mother, for real, anyone, like, factories need to be opened by, by Sierra Leoneans, not by Lebanese or Indians, you know what I mean, or, or Nigerians, but Sierra Leoneans, especially countrymen, like, like, when I say 
people can pull together from a cooperative and open up a factory making things. You know what I mean? Like soap, shampoo, body wash. I'm just saying deodorant. I'm just saying, man, we can make those things. But the but the major crowd is this though. Mother, you've lived in you've lived in America, man. You know what I mean? You've had a job in America. Cut that whole monthly salary. I had to read when I was in free time in 2013, 2014. My father and I would attest to this. We had an employee who stole a bunch of shit. Like I'm just saying, like we had an we had an employee who stole a bunch of shit, and this dude and my father was trying to now recuperate some of that. But this guy was suing suing the business because he was saying that he's owed back pay, and he was he was accused of stealing, and he was treated wrong. So, and. I was able to get my hands on the labor laws of Sierra Leone, which were laws from like 1960 something or 70 something. They were still in effect. When I say those laws were so pro, were, they they are outdated, mother. They are outdated. You know what I mean. You've walked in the United States, man. You know what? Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people who might say the system. The work system is imperfect in the United States. Yes, it might be, but at the same time, though, it's the one system I know in the world that actually works enough that it can be tweaked and implemented in other places, that it can work in other places with little tweaks based on the environmental differences in, in the other places you want to make it work in. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? I say that to say, matter. people have to stop waiting a month for a salary. You gotta do something in a way where people can can have a day off in the middle of the weekend. I mean, like a system where it's not just that old traditional. Like, get people used to working in eight-hour shifts and going home. Don't have it in place where somebody's paid a salary that's equivalent to like fifty dollars or seventy to seventy dollars a month, which is a lot of money in Sierra but it's not really that much money for real, for real, for somebody to be able to to like to like maintain. A family, you know what I mean? But honestly, God, like, imagine if instead of waiting, instead of waiting a month for you to get that seventy dollars, right? The equivalent of that seventy dollars. You know where I'm going with this matter, you know what I mean? Like, imagine if instead of them staying at work for eight, twelve hours a day, six days a week, five days a week, you know what I mean? Twenty days a month, and to get that money. Imagine if they only have to work eight hours a day. And if they work more than that eight, it's overtime, and they get paid to do extra. You know what I mean? And instead of waiting a month, they get paid every two weeks. I'm just saying, it might help. It might start changing people's attitude. You would definitely have opportunities to reduce the amount of traders in Freetown and move it back to the provinces. Honestly, man, the provinces are an untapped, untapped potential. I haven't lived in the provinces. That's why I know they're, they're an untapped potential. I've lived in Freetown recently twice in the last 20 years since I came to America, you know what I mean? And when I lived, now when I went to Sierra Leone, I, I, I wasn't gone for like two weeks or three weeks. I was gone the first time for like four months, the second time for like 10 months, 11 months. So, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I know what I'm talking about, mother. Please, like, you, you know because you've lived in the United States. I know it's going to be hard. And the most important thing is, if anybody is working for you in a factory, in a manufacturing plant or anywhere, you got to put this in place, man. If somebody works for you for eight hours a day, they got to sit in the classroom for two hours a day for free. And you're going to need a lot of teachers. And when they sit in those classrooms, all they're speaking is English, no Creole spoken, no other language spoken. You can work it out, but just make sure it's English. Our national language in Sierra Leone is English, but the de facto, the de facto language Creole has taken over everything. You walk into a business office right now, no one is speaking English. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong, but even in an English classroom in Freetown right now, a teacher trying to explain something on the blackboard is not explaining it in English, they're explaining it in Creole. And the student is gonna continue speaking Creole continue because it's easier. Mother, you know how they say from Tim, you know this, now before I know this, Creole the poor language. You understand? Eh? I'm just saying, man. Like, and the reason why I'm so adamant about having to like speak English on that level is because we need to stay competitive 
when we get the opportunity to come out to come out of Syria to go to other countries. I know because it was a it, it was a great advantage. People to this day, people were wondering how I had such a strong grasp of the English language when I had gotten here. You know what I mean? Because I actually went to school and I actually stayed in school and I actually focused in school. And I actually had teachers who taught us in English and not in Creole. It made a difference. Mr. Ture, Ms. Thompson Chloe, you know what I mean? She was at the principal, you know what I mean? I, I mean, Ms. Ms. Ture, Mr. Lansana, you know what I mean? All those teachers right there. Those were in primary school when I was known as Pupuba. What's up, Eugene John? What's going on? Somewhere Kagbo? Bobo, you alive? Bobo, you alive? See the apple, bro. Let me start, but I, I, I just, I, I, have, I have great ideas for when I get deported back to Syria. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, I, listen, man. I, if you sit there thinking, why the hell this nigga talk about being deported? Does he want to be deported? Like, not really, but if it do turn out that's the case, that's fine. Sierra Leone finally has a president who is of a generation who lived in the United States and knows U.S. system to a point and is, is probably in a position to implement things. Sierra Leone might be able to put aside partisan, tribalistic differences, psych. I'm lying like shit. That, that ain't happening no time soon. But I don't know, man. It, she might be good, you know what I mean? I'm just hoping don't nobody take my dumb ass out. But... I digress though. Next, Alonzo T. Washington, appointed by House Speaker Michael, Michael Bush. Alonzo Washington is a Democratic state delegate representing District 22, covering Prince George's County, and is a member of the Ways and Means Committee. They got a brother up in there. Yo, the U was a brother. Alonzo. So, okay. Margaret E. Williams, two. Appointed by State Superintendent of Schools, Margaret Williams is Executive Director of the Maryland Family Network. <sighs> Them people. Chester E. Finn Jr., EDD. Appointed by President State's Board of Education. Chester Finn is a former professor of education an educational policy analyst and a former United States Assistant Secretary of Education. David E. Helfman, appointed by Executive Director of Maryland State Education Association. David Helfman is the Executive, Di Executive Director of Maryland State Education Association, MSEA. Morgan Showalter, appointed by President Baltimore Teachers Union, Morgan Showalter is a high school special edu educator in the Baltimore City Public Schools and, and a member of the Baltimore Teachers Union. M. Joy Schaefer, appointed by Maryland, Board of, Maryland Association of Board of Education. Joy Schaefer is a member of the Frederick County Public School Board and immediate past president of Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Stephen H. Guthrie. Appointed by Public School Superintendent Association of America. Stephen Guthrie is a superintendent of Carroll County Public Schools. Leslie R. Pellegrino. You're not related to them Pellegrinos from that water, huh? I hope you're not. Leslie R. Pellegrino, appointed by Association of School Business Officials. Leslie Pellegrino is the Chief Financial Officer for Federal County Public Schools. Elizabeth Ilse Light, appointed by Maryland PTA. Elizabeth Light is the past president of the Maryland PTA and current director of government relations and legal affairs at Society of Professional Benefit Administrators. Craig Rice, got another brother. What up, Craig? Appointed by executive director of Maryland Association of Counties, Craig Rice is a member of the Montgomery County Council. I mean, got a big old smile on his face. Like, now let me stop. What's up, Craig? I'm just fuck with you, man. What's up, man? 
They're like, man, this fool ignorant. William R. Valentine. Boy, you white as chalk. Appointed by Executive Director, Maryland Association of Counties. Bill, quote, Valentine is the outgoing Allegheny County Commission and a member of the Maryland Commission of Counties, MACO. David R. Brinkley, appointed by ex officio. David Brinkley is the Secretary of Budget and Management for the State of Maryland, appointed by, uh, appointed by Governor Larry Hogan. Damn, Larry Hogan is still Governor? Karen B. Salmon, PhD, appointed by ex officio. Dr. Salmon is the State Superintendent of Schools. Robert L. Corrett, PhD, appointed by ex officio. Dr. Kurt is the Counselor of the University System of Maryland. Wow. Three out of 25. Sounds like America. Sounds like America. Sounds like America. So this was from November the 1st of last year, right? Almost a year ago. This was from political.com. Members only. The Supreme Court has an ethics problem. Justices on the high court don't have to follow the same code of conduct as they do in lower courts. That needs to change. By Elizabeth Warren on November the 1st, 2017. Excuse me. A few days before the Supreme Court returned from its summer break, Justice Neil Gorsuch, the court's newest member, attended a luncheon at the Trump International Hotel, where he was to give the keynote address. The location of the speech attracted the attention of dozens of protesters and a number of ethics watchdogs, who noted the apparent conflict of interest posed by, by Justice Gorsuch, a Trump nominee, keynoting an event at a hotel whose revenue goes in part to President Trump. That arrangement was bad enough on its own, but there was another potential conflict of interest created by Justice Gorsuch's speaking en engagement, and he highlights the ongoing ethical issue that threatens the credibility of our nation's highest courts. That just went out the window like shit. That sa the same morning that Justice Gorsuch gave his speech, the Supreme Court announced that it would hear Janus v. AFSCME. This is a case that would determine whether public sector unions, which represent teachers, nurses, firefighters, and police in states and cities across the country, can collect fees from all employees in the workplace they represent. Justice Gorsuch is widely expected to deliver the court's deciding vote to strip unions of this ability. A decision along these lines will seriously undercut workers' freedom to have a real voice to speak out and fight for higher wages, better benefits, and improved working conditions. Here is the verb. Justice Gorsuch's speech at the Trump Hotel was hosted by the Fund for, America's, for American Studies, and who funds the Fund for American Studies, the Charles Koch Foundation, and the Bradley Foundation. The Charles Koch Foundation is dedicated to promoting limited government, free markets, and weaker unions. And the Bradley Foundation has worked for decades to, in its own words, quote, reduce the size and power of public sector unions. In fact, the Bradley Foundation helped pay the litigation expenses for Janus, the case in which Justice Gorsuch is likely to be the deciding vote. Think about that. Just as the ink was drying on the court's decision that it will hear Janus, Justice Gorsuch was off to hobnob with some of the biggest supporters of one side of this important case, the side that wants to deny workers the freedom to build a future that doesn't hang by a thread at the, whims of, at the whim of a few billionaires. This isn't the first time the Supreme Court has strayed over the ethical line. Take a look, for example, at ABC versus Ario. Oh, yeah, yo, that was nuts. Do you know right now, you could have been getting like cable for damn near next to nothing? 
You probably couldn't even, you probably couldn't even, do you know right now, you sitting right there looking at this video, you could have had your own TV session. I could have done this on my own TV broadcast session. If that case would have went the way that billionaires did not want it to go. I digress, so I, I haven't read this this whole article yet, but I do know about the case. I, I, I do remember when, when the court decisions came down, so. Take a look, for example, as at ABC versus LVO. The court concluded that LVO, a small television streaming service, had violated the copyrights of broadcasters by capturing signals from television stations and retransmitting programming from those stations to the company's subscribers. Time Warner, one of the broadcasters who stood to lose if the court allowed the practice, filed a friend of the court brief arguing that the court should side with the broadcaster. At the time, Chief Justice John Roberts owned as much as $500,000 in Time Warner stock. Despite this blatant con conflict of interest, Roberts will not recuse himself from the case. Instead, he joined the majority in effectively killing the small streaming service. There are plenty of other examples of ethical conflict. According to Fix the Court, a nonpartisan group focused on increasing accountability and transparency to the Supreme Court, Justice Robert, Stephen Breyer, uh, Stephen Breyer and Samuel Alito owned shares in 53 publicly traded companies as of 2016. The Code of Conduct for United States Judge required judges to recuse themselves when certain potential conflicts arise such as in cases in which judges, the judge's spouse or the judge's minor children have a financial interest or in cases in which the judge has a personal bias or prejudice against or for any party in the case. But those rules don't apply to Supreme Court judges, justices. In fact, Supreme Court justices are the only federal justices who are not bound by a formal code of conduct. The reason, as explained by, just, by Justice Chief Roberts, is that the Supreme Court is the only court created under Article 3 of the Constitution, while the lower courts were created by Congress. For Chief Justice Roberts, it's sufficient that the justices consult the code when determining their ethical duty and voluntarily abide by rules on a case-by-case -case basis. The Chief Justice argument is exactly backwards. When an ethical cloud hangs over the court, its fundamental integrity is compromised. At a time when Gallup polls have found that fewer than half of Americans approve of the way the court is handling its job, the justices ought to be making every effort to show that their personal in integrity is above reproach. It is time to begin rebuilding America's confidence in the courts by establishing a formal code of conduct. That's why I co-sponsored Senator Chris Murphy's Supreme Court Ethics Act, a bill that requires the Supreme Court to adopt an ethical code. As the nation's highest court, the Supreme Court has an even greater duty to set the example for courts around the country and demonstrate that its decisions are based on a fair and unbiased assessment of the facts and the law, not personal biases or their own financial interests. Eliminating ethical questions and conflicts of interest should be the starting point. Federal judges are not supposed to be politicians or advocates. They are supposed to rise above the political winds of the day and demonstrate a single-minded commitment to one promise, equal justice on the law. As justices of the nation's highest court, it is time for Supreme Court judges to demonstrate that they can meet that standard. Elizabeth Warren is a Democratic senator from Massachusetts. You know, Justice Roberts had a hand recently. He's, he's mentioned in, in this book, I mean, uh, I think, I, yeah. You know what, yeah, I'm gonna get back to him in a minute. All right, let me. You know what? I gotta walk that Drake concert this weekend. I was going to try to have this out on the knife, honest to God, but I need the commission from this three days for this Drake concert, you know what I mean? 
Vain got to be paid for next month, just in case I don't get deported. Just in case when I go to court, Judge Latimer sees, sees it there because my case is very, very weak. There's not really a case against my deportation, but Christine, Stephen Miller, Dump Truck, Jeff Sessions, yeah, they're going to make sure that, yeah, that part. You can do that. Just don't take my life, man, please. I am begging you. This African is begging you. Please, oh, please keep me alive, please. I want to hold Geneva before my back starts hurting really, really bad. You know what I mean? I want to hold her. Maybe I can toss her. Maybe I can throw her in the air and catch her and get off. Maybe I can. So. Let me see. I'm not really, you know what I mean, I, I, I fuck with Drake, he's a living cool as fuck, you know what I mean, he ain't, he, if you ain't got a thug gangster background, don't try to come off as, as you do, you know what I mean, like I get all that, but you see what I, at the same time though, bro, you're smart as fuck, you're living cool as fuck, you know what I mean, you know how to, how to do what you do well, so, since, I'm a, Show my man some love and throw his music. I, I can't remember the last time I actually sat down and listened to Drake. So, my boy Diamond, though, that's his boy right there. What up, D? I know I'm gonna probably see a stable center there. I know he probably go, 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 come. He gonna come like, yo, what up, big dog? It's good. <laughs> Let me stop, yo. Chief Justice Roberts himself was quoting from a 1992 opinion by Chief Justice Kennedy, by Justice Anthony Kennedy in a case involving school segregation in Georgia. In that opinion, Justice Kennedy wrote, Vestiges of past segregation by state decree do remain in our society and in, 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 in our schools. Past wrongs to the black race, wrongs committed by the state and in its name, are a stubborn fact of history. A stubborn fact of history linger and persist. But though we cannot escape our history, neither must we overstate its consequences in fixing legal responsibilities. The vestiges of segregation may be subtle and intangible, but nonetheless they must be so real that they have a causal link to the de jure violation being remedied. It is simply not always the case that demographic forces causing population change bear any real and substantial relation to a de jure violation. The following pages will refute this too comfortable notion expressed by Justice Kennedy and endorsed by Chief Justice Roberts and his colleagues that wrongs committed by the state have little causal link to the residential segregation we see around us. The color of law demonstrates their racially explicit government policies to segregate our metropolitan areas and our vestiges were neither subtle nor intangible and were sufficiently controlling to construct the de jure segregation that is now with us in neighborhoods and hence in schools. The core argument of this book is that African Americans were unconstitutionally denied the means and the right to integration in middle class neighborhoods and because they did, this, this denial was state sponsored, the nation is obligated to remedy it. Many legal scholars are properly skeptical of the distinction between de jure and de facto segregation. Where private discrimination is pervasive, they argue discrimination by public policy is indistinguishably from societal discrimination. For example, if it becomes a community norm for whites to flee a neighborhood where African Americans were settling, this norm can be as powerful as if it were written into law. Both public policy discrimination and society discrimination express what these scholars term structural racism. 
in which many, if not most institutions in the country, operate to the disadvantage of African Americans. It is pointless, it is pointless that these, these scholars argue to try to distinguish the extent to which these institutions racially disparate, disparate impacts originated with private or public discrimination. Government has an obligation, they say, to remedy structural racism regardless of its causes decades ago. These scholars may be right, but in this book I don't take their approach. Rather, I adopt the narrow theory of Chief Justice Roberts, his predecessors, his colleagues, and their likely successors, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. See, you can even read a book while you smoke a blunt, while you listen to Drake. I'm just saying, you can do it all. Like, when you do it long enough, it gets to the point where you can do it with ease. You know what I mean? I had, I, I, I knew some roommates recently, like last year around this time, who they would try to disturb me when I'm sitting outside reading, enjoying the weather, smoking a spliff, and got some Bob Marley or some jazz playing on the side. They would come turn the music on and the speaker real, 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 super loud. I would just turn my music off and keep smoking and keep reading. It's not disturbing me. But the one important thing though, I got a full pack of cigarettes and you're not getting one. I got some more tree and I, I can roll one up as soon as I finish this just because y'all have seen out here want some tree and got that. I can roll another one up and smoke it, you ain't hitting it. I'm just saying, man, like. I'm just saying, man. You know. I digress, though. These scholars may be right, but in this book, I, take, I don't take their approach. Rather, I adopt the narrow legal theory of Chief Justice Roberts, his predecessors, his colleagues, and their likely successors. They agree that there is a constitutional obligation to remedy the effects of government-sponsored segregation, though not of private discrimination. I will take them at their word. Where color of law differs is not with their theory, but with their facts. For those who, like the courts, believe that the Constitution requires a remedy for, for government-sponsored segregation, for those who, like the courts, believe that the Constitution requires a remedy for government-sponsored segregation, but that most segregation doesn't fall into this category, I hope to show that Justice Roberts and his colleagues have their facts wrong. Most segregation does fall into the category of open and explicit government-sponsored segregation. Before I begin, some notes about word usage. I will frequently refer, indeed I've already done so, to things we have done or things we should do. We means all of us, the American community. This is not a book about whites as actors and blacks as victims. As citizens, as citizens in this democracy, we, all of us, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, and others, bear a collective responsibility to enforce our constitution and to rectify past violations whose effects endure. Few of us may be the direct descendants of those who perpetuated a segregated system of those who were its most exploited victims. African Americans cannot wait rectification of past wrongs as a gift, and white Americans collectively do not owe it to African Americans to rectify them. We as a whole owe this to ourselves. As American citizens, whatever route we or our, or our particular ancestors took to get to this point, we are all in this together. Over the past few decades, we have developed euphemisms. We have developed euphemisms to help us f forget how we, as a nation, have segregated African American citizens. We have been embarrassed about saying "ghetto" 
a word that accurately describes a neighborhood who, where government has not only concentrated a minority but established barriers to its exit. Projects. There were projects, residential projects that, that's why they call projects. One way in, one way out. Controlled. Man, New York still got projects here, I ain't gonna lie. Like half of the apartment complexes in New York are still past government project buildings. Haven't been updated, haven't been upgraded. And when I, and the buildings I'm talking about, the buildings that are minority, dominated population wise you know, but New York was awesome yo I will, if it's one city I will forever live in again LA is getting close to being number two on that list Freetown is always number one New York is like 1A but New York is right there man New York in my hometown Freetown Freetown because that's my hometown it's not ideal but I can handle it that's where I'm from you know what I mean I, I, I ain't tripping about that that's why I'm trying to make it better. I, like I was telling people in free time in 2013, man. I can't, I can't bring you to America. I don't have that power. But I can bring what I've learned in America to you. Yeah. Keep that shit simple. You know I mean? Sympathetical. Over the past few decades, we have developed euphemisms to help us forget how we as a nation have segregated African American citizens. We have become embarrassed about saying ghetto, a word that accurately describes a neighborhood where government has not only concentrated a minority, but established barriers to its exit. We don't, we don't hesitate to acknowledge that Jews in Eastern Europe were forced to live in ghettos where opportunity was limited and and living was difficult or impossible. Where you think they got the idea from? Yet, when we encounter similar neighborhoods in this country, we now delicately refer to them as the inner city. Yet everywhere else, where, yet, yet everyone knows what we mean. When affluent whites gentrify the same ge geographic areas, we don't characterize those whites as inner city families. Before we become ashamed to admit that the country has circums circumscribed African Americans in ghettos, analysts of race relations, both African American and white, consistently and accurately use ghetto to describe low income African American neighborhoods created by public policy with a shortage of opportunity and with barriers to exit. No other term succinctly describes this combination of characteristics, so I use the term as well. Yo, yeah, see why I like how, how this man wrote this book. I had never heard of him before. I had never read any of this book. This is the first one. But just the way how he contextualized what's going to in a way that most books don't do. At the end of that, that sentence though, he has, uh, there's, a, uh, there's an asterisk, and the asterisk has an explanation. The asterisk says, in 1948, Robert Weaver, long before becoming the first African American to serve in the cabinet, wrote a book called The Negro Ghetto that documented how government segregated the nation. That was in 1948. 70 years ago 70 years ago yeah in 1965 kenneth b clark man what the smartest black man ever that i've never met in 1965 kenneth b clark the social psychologist whose research was relied upon by the supreme court in brown versus board of education published dark ghetto which described the lack of opportunity in New York City's Harlem. In 1968, 50 years ago, the Connor Commission, the National Advisory Com Committee on Civil Disorders,